And so Matt's from Matson from Engage VR, and he's I can't I'm just going to shut up because he's going to tell you all about himself and everything else. But what he's doing is truly groundbreaking, and I want to thank you for being here. And go for it; it's all yours. All right, what we're rock all and roll. doing is incredibly groundbreaking. The mere fact that you are all here from all over the world in this space—you're all groundbreakers. You're all pioneers. And I got to say, it was last year at Oculus Connect Five where I really got my feet wet with educators in VR in general, where it was finally recognized that this was a community and there was hundreds of educators there. And you guys are a excited group of people. I mean, the VR community at large is super excited and just an amazing community where you develop relationships where you can travel anywhere you want in the world and spend time with friends. But the educators community is incredibly vibrant also. What an awesome group of pioneers, champions from all your educational institutions. And uh, I was talking earlier, you know, I got to watch the digital age take shape, you know, moving from analog to digital. And I had done some VR stuff prior to this modern wave of consumer VR. But really, my journey started, and I was doing uh, um, mental health for 20 years, uh, worked in the mental health field, doing all kinds of different things, working with families and individuals. And my first journey started when I ordered the DK1, and it arrived at my house very early on. I had to wait horrible two months watching others enjoy it on their YouTube channels and streaming videos. And this is where I started, was in the Tuscany room. This was my first real taste of the next wave of consumer VR. And I was absolutely blown away that I could feel presence in a space like this. I then quickly turned to a program called Greebles. I don't know if you old schoolers remember the Greebles one. Any hearts out there for this? This was the first one that really blew my mind. And I said to myself, for a couple of hundred dollars, I just purchased myself a personal planetarium. It's like, I was a huge planetarium guy, right? I would go to all the shows, and all of a sudden I can have this experience in my room and see things in true scale. Things started really clicking in my head at that point. It's like, wow, this can do things that no other medium can. It can show true scale. And this is where it really clicked for me. Rift Max Theater. This was the first social VR platform that I'm aware of on the modern consumer wave. Obviously, there was a lot of stuff going on in universities, etc. But this is the first place where anybody that had a headset anywhere in the world could join together in a virtual space. This was 2013, 2014-ish. And I walked in, and the developer of that platform, Mike Armstrong, met me in the hallway. And I, I didn't even realize it was a human at first. And he came walking over to me, and then I realized he was a human. And he started talking to me and he invaded my personal space bubble and I took a couple of steps backwards and I went, wow, that was powerful. How in the hell did a digital person just invade my personal space bubble? That is true social presence. And it dawned on me at that time all the things that would become possible in VR collaboratively and that we have this incredible new space where we can teleport our consciousness to any shared digital space where the laws of physics no longer apply, that any physical barriers can be overcome. We can do anything. We have unlimited space to build and do anything we want, to educate, to bring in 3D objects, to collaborate where the limitations of physical reality simply no longer apply, unless we want them to, unless we want to simulate that. This is powerful. The sky this is one of Daniel's sayings, great <laughs> saying uh, that we kind of adopted, educators in VR, the sky no longer really is the limit. Everything becomes possible in virtual reality where we can develop relationships where we can explore science, where we can see things that you can't see in the physical world, where you can shrink down to the side what things look like. I don't know if you guys have ever done that Neos Universe program where you can shrink yourself down and there's a certain point when you're shrinking where all of a sudden nothing is relative to my 
current reality. It's like there's this transition stage where you get s small enough that nothing is recognizable. And then you do the opposite. And you get large enough where nothing is recognizable. It's like a little sliver of reality. And VR can help us expand beyond that and do things. So why does that matter in classrooms? Why am I going off on all this crazy stuff? I think it's important because we have this new, incredibly powerful technology that I firmly believe we need to teach our kids and others how to use this technology. And that's where all, all of us play a very, very important role, that we understand what this platform is capable of, that we can understand how to bet. We have here, I refer to this generation as the mind. These kids are no stranger to virtual worlds. They are no 3D. They've been looking into a 3D window, years and years and years. Study for spatial computing, it's ridiculous. They are so excited about this coming down the pile in many ways. They've been living as uh, Terrence McKenna, by the, by the time holds the size of man. Those worlds represent them, their thoughts, their fears. This is me, that we're reflecting ourselves in our creations. Man, it's 2020, and we are moving into some wild times, guys, where we are communicating through these me in very personal and powerful ways. Digital world familiarity. The opportunities in spatial technology for these kids that we are teaching are going to be huge. This is like the early days of the Internet, right? Every company, every corporation has a website. Now, if you don't have a website, you're not legit. The same thing's going to happen with virtual reality. Every entity is going to need a virtual space, something to do with spatial technology, whether it's AR, VR, XR. These kids are going to have a lot to do, and these are our future builders, and I'm so excited for that. And the opportunities that are going to be presented to them are amazing, and it's our job to get them set up now to take advantage of these opportunities. And that means learning the nuances of VR and really, truly understanding it so that we can propel them to take advantage of these things. Here's our kids today. This was a Steve Bamberry's uh, Twitter the other day. He just gave a presentation out in uh, Saudi Arabia. And here's the, I mean, these kids, look at this, virtual reality. These kids can be anything, go anywhere, experience anything. I kind of wish I was a kid again, to be honest with you. Exciting times ahead. All right. So we believe in VR, we think it's important to teach kids the proper ways to VR, and yet we've got this sometimes what feels like a monumental task ahead of us of how do we actually get our classes set up in VR? How do we get this stuff rocking and rolling? Well, look, let's look at our headset options first of all. Six degree of freedom PC-based headsets. This is the creme de la creme. This is the real good stuff. I'm actually in an index right now myself. It is my go-to headset when I'm here at home, which also doubles as my lab downstairs. And uh, it's so comfortable. It's a little on the expensive side. It's $999. This is called $1,000. $1,000 for the full setup if you don't have any of the other components already. But it gives you that nice finger tracking. You know, if these hands were set up, I could be wiggling my fingers right now. It's got incredible sound over the ears. The speakers don't even touch your ears. They hang out over the top of them. Um, it's got the pass-through cameras, so looking forward to a little augmented reality, mixed reality capabilities here. Uh, awesome, awesome headset. You know, downsides is it still is, uh, well, it can be argued downsides and positive that it's got the lighthouse tracking. Lighthouse tracking is great for putting my hands behind my back and still have that tracking going. But it is outside in tracking, and that can sometimes cause problems in the physical space, especially if you have multiple headsets all needing their tracking. Um, reflections, things like that get in the way. But fantastic headset. Uh, those that tend to get sick in VR, I know a lot of developers that are do actually get VR sick, 
a lot of them have claimed that using the index has reduced their sickness greatly, that they can actually do longer stints in reality. It's a great headset. The Oculus Rift, $399, pretty dang affordable. Um, it's a good headset. The visual quality looks pretty darn good. Um, it's got the inside out tracking, right? So we no longer need those darn cameras looking at us that always caused us problems in the past. If you wanted room scale, you kind of almost needed to go with the three camera setup with the CV1. But now that we've got the Oculus Rift, it's, it, you can easily tote it around with you, plug it into a laptop, which by the way, how cool is that that we can run VR off laptops and stuff now? I remember back in the day when we would go do, we would have to pull these big wagons of hardware with us to set up a demo. Now I can put two or three headsets when I travel on a plane and take VR everywhere with me. High-end PC-based VR. How about the HTC Vive? Oh, let me let me go back one. Um, the Oculus Rift, you know, different platform. It's it's the Facebook ecosystem. Um, sometimes I I yeah. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit later. <laughs> HT, HTC Vive, Vive Port Steam platform. Check out these price breaks downs. We got the gamer system, three hundred ninety nine bucks for the old school Vive. Thank you. HTC for giving us real room scale hands in the game. That was an awesome time to see that transition, right? $399 for that old boy. It is looking a little on the pixelated side these days. I don't know if you've gone from a high-end headset kind of back to the OG ones. Uh, you're definitely going to see some pixels there. And things stand out more when you go in reverse, right? Um, the professional Vive Pro. Great headset, good visual quality. Um, it's got a nice deep dark black, crisp colors. I love this headset. Uh, just over a thousand dollars, though. That's a kind of a hard pick between that and the the index, right? And, and we got. The Prize edition that's got the new lighthouses there and it's got the updated controllers. Um, these headsets also do pass through as well, so you can do a little bit of, of, of mixed reality there also. So great headsets. The Vive Cosmos, it's on sale. They just knocked a hundred dollars off it. It was six ninety-nine, now it's down to five ninety-nine. It's an interesting headset in that it's kind of like this, some people call it the Franken headset because it's got so many capabilities. You can actually take that front headset plate off and replace that with one that now uses the, the, the light tracking if you so desire and swap to bring different. It does look very good. Um, trackers, they've had to get it up to speed to wear criticism about an interesting headset. I agree it's with this one, I think, but HP Reverb. Now we're talking about the headsets, right? It's sure you've got the Lenovo, you got the Sears in there, Things Ocean, $649, you know, um, Windows based, still access all the Steam software. Let's hop on over to the standalones. All right, so this is what has really got going and get this when you talk to people on the streets this is what they're talking about the oculus quest man and thank god for beat saber right seriously <laughs> like all those people that were kind of scared of vr of this crazy technology that isolates people and it's beat saber and games such as that have made it become public awareness and people are okay with it this is a cool party game that doesn't have to be antisocial People are less scared of VR because of things like this. Oculus has poured tons of money, or Facebook, I should say, has poured tons of money into marketing over the season. They're selling like hotcakes. I think you're, some of you are probably reading the top line here. Oculus Quest, $399, unless you're getting Enterprise. Uh-oh. $1,000 plus another, I believe it's $150, and, and some more change to keep the enterprise license going, but the hardware is going to cost you $1,000 if you go enterprise. What does that mean? A lot of people are asking that out on the streets, people that I'm talking to. What does that mean? Can I buy a retail version of $399 and use it in my classroom, or 
am I supposed to buy the thousand dollars? What if I buy 12 of these and, and, and like my terms of service is violated? So there's a lot of questions. Oculus is still trying to figure this out. It's Facebook's still trying to figure this out. We'll see where all this goes. We need to clo keep a close eye, but keep that in mind that it's not just $399. If you go in enterprise, it's going to cost you a lot more money. Ha! Oh, brings hand tracking. Who here's who here's tried the hand tracking now in the quest and, and been able to see your actual hands in the experience? Awesome stuff. Takes us back to the leap motion days, right? I remember that was so magical when we first tried that. Amazing stuff. HTC Vive Focus Plus. So, the, the Facebook is ruling the roost when it comes to entertainment. VR gaming and entertainment with the Quest, hands down, they're way out ahead. And they're not stopping. We're still seeing innovation regularly. I mean, those of you that have had a Quest for a long time have seen the innovation happen as software updates continue to take place. And it's like, wow, this thing's enhancing beyond my belief. I can now plug it into my computer and run PC level uh, software on my Quest. Now the HTC Vive Focus, uh, that's taken a little bit of a different route. They're really looking more at the enterprise market. And what I love about these guys is they've got the solutions for kiosk mode, where as an educator, you can be aware of what your students are doing in the headset. You can control uh, what they're watching. You can make it very easy for them to select the appropriate software so they're not having to get lost in the in this, uh, you know, the Steam system or anything like that, that they can actually control it, that they can do simultaneous streams so everybody's doing the same thing at the same time, just makes it a lot more easier when you're talking about large numbers of headsets to be able to manage those. Now, Oculus is going to do the same thing. It's just taking a while to get there. You know, it is definitely in the works, uh, but we're still waiting to see how all that rolls out. Okay. Pico Neo 2. Let's keep a close eye on this one. There's going to be a lot of people trying this at CES this week. Great headset from what I'm reading. 4K resolution. It can stream to your PC as well. It's standalone. These are electromagnetic controllers. So it tracks both your hands. And you know, you can do the whole put your hand behind your head. It's not going to lose tracking because it's not optical tracking. Now, I'm not sh quite sure how responsive they're going to be. I can't wait to get my hands on these and give it a fair shake. But these guys are all about education and, and uh, enterprise as well. So they've got some awesome solutions with those same sorts of kiosk modes. Um, you can have, you know, if, if there's um, a third party that's wanting to bring their software to a, another company, they can have their stuff all preloaded and it just starts as soon as you put on the headset. There's lots of ways. It's an open system basically. Lots of ways that you can use this headset. I'm kind of looking at this as possibly ideal for educators. Keep a close eye. That's all I'm saying. Keep a three degrees of freedom. Is that still a thing? Yeah, it's still a thing. It's really designed to consume media. I mean, if you're way into 360 videos and and 360 field trips and and hanging out with people, what this on the plane any day? That's an awesome little headset. I've got a couple of them here at home. Want to do VR at night in bed, and I'm just laying down. And I want to watch something. Isn't this over my quest because it feels better on the back of the head when you're laying on a pillow? It's just a Nice travel headset that's showing off media, which we often use in our class. So, and that price. Maintenance. How am I doing on time here, Laurel? Oh my goodness. Okay, we got to get moving. This is a big one. You just spent all this money on a head. I can't tell you guys the number of times that I've gone into a classroom or an enterprise situation. Situation and I look at them like, oh my gosh, these lenses are trash. All it's these things are delicate. I mean, they're robust on one hand. I can do some crazy stuff with my headsets, but when it comes to the lenses, careful. Um, make sure those things are clean. Using a microfiber cloth, 
Um, I love, let me go to the next slide here, the VR cover. That's what I use. They've got a lot of different options that you can put these different covers on. It's got this PU kind of full leather stuff here that you can easily wipe down with um, antibiotic wipes. Give those a wipe there. Don't use that on the lenses though. Really, you're supposed to be just using a microfiber or maybe a little, little dab of, of moisture with just water. So just be really careful with your headsets, guys. And here's the big one. I have damaged be beyond repair some of my headsets with this next one. Oh yeah, glasses, glasses. Most headsets now come with spacers that you insert into the headset. Don't throw that away. It's easy to, hey, oh, what's that? And just toss it. Spacers for people with glasses so the glass doesn't touch the glass. If your lenses of your glasses are touching the lenses on your headset, man, it is going to destroy your lenses. Um, I've lost two quests because of that uh, because I wasn't the one doing the demo I found I, what is this smudge yeah it's glasses um, be very 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 careful hardware software management this is a big one we were kind of talking about kiosk mode and all that keep in mind the more headsets you have the more difficult it's going to be to manage what about powering them up recharging them you got to have a storage space you got to run all the, the electri electrical to charge your headsets up when they're not in use, keeping the batteries, you know, how many batteries do you want to go through as a classroom? It might be a wise idea to buy those rechargeable batteries, right? These are things you got to keep in mind. Ah, yes, the magic side quest. Who's familiar with the side quest? Side quest, yeah, man, okay. So, as we know, Oculus has really focused primarily on gaming, which is great, which is great, don't get me wrong, but for us educators that are craving educational content, it's a little bit lacking. They do have some awesome stuff. In fact, our Apollo 11's on there, which I'm thrilled that we were a launch title, one of my favorite titles even before I worked for Immersive VR Education. Um, there is some great stuff, but if you want to really dive into the experimental stuff, really get into, there's so many us, even in our educators in, in VR community, there's people building stuff and putting it on SideQuest right now specifically for education. You get that, it's going to open up a whole new world for you. And if you even look at the picture here of the woman in the wheelchair over here, this is a Coldplay app uh, that I just discovered recently. Um, that's and that's actually used for a kind of a kiosk mode and you can manage multiple headsets with that and, and help people out from a distance that aren't in the experience. Lots of fun to be had there guys, seriously. You need to download SideQuest and not only that, but it also has the ability when your, your Quest is plugged in that you can start changing the fixed foveated rendering. If you guys don't know what that is, that means that the graphics will look better if you change that up because it's only giving you the high res graphics right where your fovea is, right where your vision is. Everything else in the peripheral is kind of, uh, it's less, uh, they, they, they don't render it as high. And it doesn't matter because that's the way it works in real life too, you know. Our peripheral is not as sharp as right there in the center of your vision. So this only renders the center of the vision rock solid so you can run things faster and make them look better, have a higher end graphical experience at less the pro with less processing power. Uh, lots of different things you can change up on there. Ah, okay. How about this one for an easy one? Springboard VR. These guys are awesome. If you want to collaborate with them, they will set you up with everything you need as an educator. Not only will they help you with your hardware, but they also curate content. So here, I always run into teachers. I don't know what to get for my system. I don't know what the kids are going to respond to. I'm new to this. I love VR. I know it rocks. It's an amazing experience, but I need help in finding out what to run on it. Springboard VR will give you your hardware management and your software management all in one. Awesome, awesome group of people to work with. Mace Virtual Labs. And I'm sure there's a number of companies like Mace that are popping up around the world, helping people get their VR labs and classrooms as established. Mace is based down in Houston, Texas. I was just down there at Houston Community College. They have 120,000 students there. They're going all in on VR, guys. They just built themselves a killer lab. Mace Virtual Labs built this. They've got the Vario headsets. Uh, you want to talk, that's human high resolution, guys. There are no pixels involved in the Vario headset. I didn't include it on there because it's not 
typically what schools purchase because they've got Vario headsets, they've got the uh, Virtuous on place, an amazing place. Um, we did a virtual ribbon cutting there. We actually had guys in Ireland cutting the rib. Confetti fell down, and and the and these the heads of the of the university are all looking out that ribbon cutting experience. Uh, if you want to see people who are putting uh, are making VR work, and there's some resources. We got Dr. Angelina Dayton here who goes. VR lady. She is robbers in the day. She is spreading VR to schools everywhere. Follow her on Twitter. You're going to get a lot of insight from her. Shannon Putman down in Kentucky. Uh, amazing. Rocking it in her, her grade school. Now, I, I've mostly worked with high schoolers. A whole different beast. So, so is Dr. Dayton, too. Both of them are masters at that, and uh, Shannon's kind of lost it. Keep an eye on her. Big news coming from her soon enough. L lot, lot of, of uh, onboarding in school. Steve Banbury, one of my dearest friends, uh, uh, from Dubai. D and VR sessions um, every month now. Uh, there was a little break there, but he's back in the saddle. He just started a new company called Digital Inception. He helps people figure out how to integrate virtual reality. This is what he does now full time. In integrate virtual reality into their classrooms. Definitely keep an eye on this guy and come to some of his events. The CPD in VR events are amazing. Full body avatars in engage and we do the craziest things. I mean, this guy is as pro as they come. Oh shoot. VR sickness is real guys. And it sucks for those that are susceptible to this. We need to talk about VR sickness. Okay. I was at a university recently, and one of the instructors there brought over a couple of young women and said, we got a problem. They're in the VR class, you know, they're in our VR program, and they get sick in VR. They cannot use a headset. Well, what's the deal? Um, let me back up a little bit. What causes VR sickness? It's a mismatch between what your body is doing physically and what's happening in virtual reality. It throws off the vestibular system. Because if I do this in the real world, I'm expecting that vestibular system to react to that. If I'm standing completely still and moving around while standing still, all of a sudden the vestibular system is saying, why am I not feeling moving? Am I poisoned? Oh, this is one theory one theory maybe i'm poisoned maybe there's something wrong and you get sick to throw it up there's lots of different theories but we do know there's a direct correlation with the vestibular system not matching up with what's happening in the virtual world now there's certain things that happen in vr that make people more prone to motion sickness one of those things is not walking around naturally i'm in my basement lab right now physically walking around most people are going to find this okay because everything's matching up just fine. But if I stop and I start using my joystick to drift around, I'm going to feel a little bit weird. And I remember feeling weird back in the day, back in 2013. It took me a little bit to acclimatize myself to that unnatural locomotion, right? So keeping your students not, I highly recommend don't have your students using, at least in the beginning, until they're experienced with VR, don't have them using artificial locomotion. Have them move naturally through the experience or teleport around, just like you can do here in alt space. I always recommend that to people. I never start people off with artificial locomotion. Um, bad performing uh, hardware. Frame rates dropping down too low will get people sick. You got to make sure your stuff is performing at par, that you're meeting that 72 frames a second. 90 frames a second, you got to match it up or you're going to get sick. Um, sorry, guys. <clears throat> so um, what about those people that are at, so let me go back to my story with the two, two young ladies. So I asked them, I said, well, what VR have you been doing? Oh, well, we've been doing 360 videos. Okay, what kind of 360 videos have you been doing? And then they explained it to me. 
Now, you guys probably know this already, but there's some 360 videos that are just fine because great care has been taken to not have a jumpy camera. One of the worst 360 experiences I've ever done is going whitewater rafting down the Colorado River in VR. Not happening. I lasted like 10 seconds, right? It's, you got to be careful. There's probably about 2 million. I, nine months ago, I, I knew there was over a million 360 videos on YouTube. I'm betting there's probably close to 2 million now. A lot of those are garbage because, not that they're bad, but they're just garbage for VR because they haven't made them for VR. They made them for a phone that you could look around with. In that case, it's fine, but you got to be super careful. So what I did with this, with these young ladies is I put them in the, in the Quest. I put them in the National Geographic starting room, which is awesome. It's a recreation of like a library, right? And I turned off the boundary system so they could walk around this really large area. One of the girls did not get sick. Evidence there, right? Physical movement. She wasn't, you know, strapped to a chair going down some wild experience. The other one, just looking at the headset, got sick. Her brain had already been conditioned because she tried to power through it. Do not power through sickness. You let your students know if they feel at all sick. They take off that headset and we try something different at a later time. If you push through it, you're going to form that association in the brain and it's, it, it's just going to make it worse. It's going to make it worse. Be very careful. That's all I'm saying. Safety. Ah. ah. What, about, what about that 13 age limit? What does that mean? You can't use it at 13. Now. Yeah, yeah. A lot of concern. Thankfully, we're at a stage now where people are starting to do. Um, I got one I'm going to share with you here in a second, but I just wanted to share this with you. Stanford Virtual Human Interaction lab they got a repository of a bunch of studies that have been done that I think will be helpful to all of you to look through those if you have questions this is a great place to uh, check that out um, Alvin Wayne Graylin China president of uh, HTC Vive he happening out in China and uh, he often links to those and and what I'm going to tell you in general is the studies are looking promising. I was re actually really scared for a long time thinking, what if it is bad? What's that going to do to our industry? Fortunately for us, the studies have been actually rather positive. And in some, see that it's just like the vision has improved, right? Uh, which is crazy. Um, they, it's almost using like cell phones and tap and stuff can sometimes be more damaging to virtual reality. Keeping young minimal time is important. Need schoolers in for a whole lot of studies to be the implications. St. Louis Children's Hospital at Washington University. This just came out. To assess the safety of VR 3D headsets, binocular stereoscopic near eye display use in young children. Product safety warnings that accompany VR headsets ban their use in children under 13 years of age. Let's see what happened. Conclusion. Young children tolerate fully immersive 3D virtual reality games without noteworthy effects on visual motor functions. VR play did not induce significant post-VR posterior inability or maladaption of the vestibular ocular reflex. The prevalence of discomfort and after effects may be less than that reported for adults. Well, well, cool, cool. Again, this is just one study, but I am looking forward to a lot more studies being done. This is very reassuring to me when I see this sort of thing. Intro to parents. I mean, VR is still a mystery to so many people. They just, uh, a lot of people don't understand. I think it's important that we involve the parents when we implement VR in the classroom. One way to do that, like the homeschoolers did, Virtual reality open house. Let's impress these parents. Let's knock their socks off and give them an experience that they won't forget. And let's not put them in something that's going to make them sick either because that won't be good. But something like Apollo 11 or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tout this one, Titans of Space Plus that just came out. 
awesome, awesome. Everyone should download that if you're an educator. It's the best tour of the solar system I've ever had. Uh, Drash is the developer of that. He's absolutely amazing. Uh, but yeah, let's rock it with the parents. Get them in. Get them involved. Show them how future, into the future your school is and that you're prepping the kids for this, the future of spatial uh, computing. And you're probably going to need to sign some forms to have the parents sign off on forms that it's okay for their kids to follow the curriculum that you set up for that VR. Setting the stage, this is important. <clears throat> oh, I, I will scream about this till the cows come home. Do not, do not prank, touch, or scare the user. <sighs> come on. I, I would have been tempted to do the, do the same thing when I was in high school. Everybody wants to prank the user. Everyone wants to scare them. Here's the girl's totally vulnerable out on the Richie's plank experience and you got someone coming up and giving them a little shove someone's gonna get hurt and even if they don't get hurt what's more likely to happen is they're gonna lose trust and for people to be able to let themselves go and experience presence the way it's meant to be experienced they need to have trust and know that people aren't going to interfere with that it's a big deal um, I also think that when you're in the classroom, pair them up or even have three to a group. One person in the headset, it's crystal clear that it's all supportive. There's no pranking going on. Two to three, the other one or two are watching the person have the experience. They trade the headsets. They share their thoughts. It's really awesome to be able to work in groups. And, and uh, yeah, to, th this has to be a hard and fast rule. But what does this button do? I can't tell you the number of times I see people using headsets and they don't even have it set to their IPD. It's like, wow, you're missing out. Every headset needs to be dialed in to the specifications of the user. Do you know what your IPD is? If you don't, you probably should. Mine's a 68.5 and that's why it's hard for me, to, unfortunately, to use the Rift S because it's a fixed lens system. Something else to consider when you're picking out headsets for your classroom with kids especially who might have a smaller IPD do you really want a headset that you can't physically change the IPD on right um, I can use the Rift S for about 30 minutes and I max out any other headset that has a physical IPD setting I can use easily for three hours without taking it off um, help them become familiar with their headsets walk through every part of it show them have them physically hold the controllers before they even go into their first experience feel the weight of the controllers look at those buttons look at that thumbstick what does this button do over here oh that's the pass through button that that allows me to look through the camera they need to understand their headsets space is a big consideration if you simply don't have the space, then maybe your 3 dot headset is the way to start out. Hopefully you've got some space or there's a gym or something you can go to for the space because you're going to need some space. Ten headsets? Wow, you kind of need a lot of space. If you're using the old uh, lighthouse tracking, uh, it's going to be problematic um, in any kind of a space unless it's partitioned off. The new lighthouses uh, do much better for that. But space is a big issue. you got to figure that out, where your student's going to be standing. And if they are in the same space, oh, that's the next slide. In space, you're going to want to get the headphones going, guys, because when you're in a social setting like we're in right now and you've got collaboration going on, you're going to get that echo effect, and it's going to really be a difficult experience. Now, if you're in separate spaces, that's fine. But in the same space, you've got to have the headphones, especially with the new Oculus headsets that all the sounds coming out of the bands, right? Firewalls. Firewalls are a big deal. Whenever I can't connect to somebody in virtual reality that's joining me from a school, nine times out of ten, it's going to be a firewall issue. You need to be working with your IT guys and whatever platforms you're using, you're going to be, need to figure out what port you're going to have to open on the router, etc., right? So just keep that in mind that if you're having difficulties, if you can't access stuff, it could be a firewall issue. <clears throat> okay, this one, I'm going to go a little deeper on this one. Mindfulness 
and presence when you're in VR. I think it's important to condition the kids to this, to talk about this, that this is, how do I say this? This is a powerful medium. If you just turn kids loose in VR without having these solutions, it's gonna be absolute chaos. Good luck in reeling them in. They're just gonna be running around crazy, running through things, trying to figure it out, da da da. I think VR, gives us an incredible opportunity to slow down, to appreciate things, to pay attention. When I pull up a virtual object in front of me, I want to be able to examine that closely, bring it in close, and experience that. When you, ex when you practice mindfulness in VR, it will take you to very deep levels of, of, of feeling as though you're present. There's many different levels of presence and practicing these mindfulness skills will enhance your presence, I promise you. Caitlin Krauss, uh, who's a mindfulness expert, and I, we've been doing uh, experiments in VR. Is that Caitlin? And, <laughs> Caitlin it is Caitlin, hi Caitlin. And, and we've been just blown away of how present you can be when, when, when you pay attention and you take the time to do that. Respect the environment. I'm also a firm believer that if you're always running around in VR and you're walking through tables and jumping through walls and doing things that you normally wouldn't do in the physical world, that over time, I think it actually numbs the ability to be present as much. You know, a lot of people talk about how I felt so much more present when I first started doing VR and now I kind of take it for granted. I think respecting the environment in VR actually helps you maintain the ability to achieve those deeper levels of presence. These VR, VR tutorials are awesome. For the first time use, I just uh, went and onboarded a school in Boston, and this is what I started with was first steps. And we did the pairing up thing, you know, where one would be in the headset, one would be out of the headset. First Steps is amazing. You hardly have to say anything, if ever, which is an ideal demo, right? When you don't have to talk, you let them experience it. It really sucks when you take somebody out of presence, I'll tell you. Uh, shut up. <laughs> Just let them do their thing unless you absolutely have to step in. Uh, the Vive Lab is a classic. You guys all know this. Uh, these are great places to start. Just to get them used to the controllers, get them used to what being in VR is, and then stop. Process it afterwards. What was that like for you, John? Amy, what was that like for you? What was your favorite part? What makes this a different medium? You should be doing this before and after all of your experiences. Beforehand, kind of prepping them, letting them know what they're about to experience, getting them hyped up, but also setting expectations of, you know, and remember, we all need to respect each other. We all need to slow down. We need to be mindful when we go in. And then a post-processing of what that experience meant to them, what it did for them. Super important. So this is kind of my thing that I'm doing right now. It's like consume, create, collaborate. There's so much to consume out there right now. How fortunate for people jumping into VR at this time of the game. There's so much available. Um, Again, how do we manage that? Here's a little snapshot. I mentioned Springboard VR earlier. This is from their website. They curate all kinds of awesome stuff. So if you do end up going with Springboard, they got you covered there. I'm getting the 10 minute warning sign. So <laughs> just blast through this, guys. Um, again, Steve Banbury. He has got like hundreds and hundreds of like 360 experiences you can access on YouTube, different software that he reviews. It's the Virtually Teach website. Head on over there. That's going to give you a nice uh, leg up as an educator on where to start and what to, what to load. Um, I'm going to... As you all know, you know, we got Beat Saber. We got all these things that we can try out. One thing I wanted to just throw in here real quick is reality capture. I'm throwing that in because it's really going to be a thing, guys, that we're bringing real world places into VR, not only through 360 videos, 360D videos, 183D videos, but even more importantly, we're spatially capturing these places now. 
where we, when I'm on that surface of Mars and I've got that data from the, uh, the Mars rover that's done all those photographs and we put that through a software and we've made it into 3D, when I reach down and touch that pebble on the ground, that pebble actually exists on Mars, winning reality to us. This is a no joke technology. Um, it's developed fast right now to the point where we can take a cell phone, I can scan an object, I can upload that into one of my favorite uh, uh, platforms, and bam, there it is. We did this with some students where they, they built a weather balloon and they put different devices on the weather balloon to send up. They actually scanned the weather balloon objects with their phone, put it into Engage, and put the weather balloon together. And uh, yeah, that was Kwaku that worked with me on that. And, and that's what we can do now. We can, I can like bring my basement, I can scan my basement and bring it into VR now. This is amazing that we can now bring reality to us. We can explore the tombs of Egypt, etc., etc. This is us flying, by the way, on couches. This is actually a traditional, three, three, a, a traditional 3D um, video where we've added uh, three, 3D three uh, objects to it. Again, this is all... Google Earth VR, come on, that's in VR and say find the following destination and just let them go try to do that. They're going to learn so much in that process and processing that afterwards is an amazing experience. <sighs> Create, oh my God, okay, the fact that we can use these creation programs and then bring those assets into a space like Altspace or Engage or Rumi or any of these other platforms that we can use blocks and tilt brush that are amazing experiences in and of themselves, but now we can use those things that we're creating to bring into spaces like this. And we can share it with a global audience. Any educator, you, you're not, you don't even have to just educate in your own domain now. You've got an entire global audience that you can give lessons to and share your expertise with. Uh, Views Camera, awesome company. Bring your 3Ds, 180s, bring your stuff. Get your kids a camera. Let them create some experiences to bring in and share together. Because now you can jump in those 360s as a group. Like I could bring all of you into a 360 theater and we can watch it together. Danny Bittman, I gotta give him a shout out. If you want tutorials on all the creation, on all those tools and how to understand the entire pipeline, super easy videos to understand. He's talking to beginners as well as experts. Check out his stuff. And finally, quickly, I know I gotta wrap this up. Virtual worlds, I could spend an hour on this. Make sure that you know what virtual worlds are out there, which ones will be the most successful to use, collaboration platforms, etc. Ryan Schultz has like, I think 140 uh, social platforms that he's reviewed. Check his website out. Um, make sure before you go, before you turn your kids loose that they understand not step number one when you go into a platform like that, if it's not private already, Make sure that they understand the trust and safety systems that should be available on every platform. Go into detail on that. Make sure that they're, they know how to use it and can prove that they can use it by role playing or whatever you need to do. Make sure that they can prove it. Um, collaboration. Sorry guys, I'm just going to whip through these slides super quick. I mean, everything's possible. It's so much fun as a group, right? And uh, Educators in VR right there. There we go. Um, I'm going to quit there because we are out of time. Each of these sections, we could dive into an hour easily. But thank you all, and let's make 2020 rock, guys. Let's change the face of education. VR is going to be amazing. <laughs> and what a great start. What a fantastic start. Oh, my God. Amazing. Chris, thank you so much. Wow, everybody. All right. So, are you ready for some questions, my friend? I guess so. I hope I can answer them. <laughs> All right. So, let's see. Um, we are going to run over, just letting people know. I'm going to hit the raise hand button. All right. So, if you have a question, please hit that raise hand button down in your lower right side, and we will get to some questions here for Chris. So, our wonderful buddy, Rob, your first Rob up, is the go man. for it. Rob is the hey, man. Hey, Chris. 
Hey, um, so, you know me, but for those who don't, I, I'm at uh, Georgian College in Ontario, Canada, and I'm really concerned about this Oculus Enterprise version that's coming out. I'm wondering if you have any more insight. I knew, into that, I that, knew that question was coming so, up. So, we've got, you know, we've got, we've got 18 <laughs> Oculus Quest in our program, and I'm looking to purchase another 40 um, when it's back online into February. So, any insights into what implications that will have? or educational institutions who are early adopters? You know, uh, I know it's not the answer you want to hear, but the answer is mm -hmm. I don't know right now because it's all still mm -hmm. playing out, right? I don't know mm -hmm. what ultimately the direction is going to be here. I look at a $1,000 price tag. It concerns me for K through 12. That, and then the question of do I have that or can I have one or two Quests that aren't, yeah. it's just, it's a lot of questions. I don't know. It seems like the other companies have managed it well. You kind of know what you're getting right out of the gate. It's not doubling the price of their headsets. I just, no. do you know, I don't know. Do you know of a contact know, uh, within Oculus? Because I um, I sent a message to Cindy Ball, who's the education manager for Oculus, and haven't heard a response at all to uh, early adopters. And, you know, cut us some slack on the enterprise issue. I, I, I think it's a fair question to say. Um, I think there's so many of us ready to implement in our schools. What mm. guide us? What do we need to do? Do you think, Laurel? Maybe, maybe we can get an Oculus rep to our big event in February. That's yeah. it. We're be trying. Freaking We're amazing! Trying. I think that needs yes, to happen. Yes, yes. Yeah, um, can I just let's add on that, that point? I am talking to Oculus uh, sometime this week. It's the education team I'm talking to, so I'll raise that issue with them. Yay. Beautiful. Yeah. Yay. Okay, ideally, I'd like, some, I'd like a rep from all the different headset manufacturers to come in and just lay it out for us. That would be so That's valuable. The goal. I, hope we've, I hope we've got three. I hope we can yeah. at least got three, <laughs> maybe four. Oh, <laughs> I love it. But I hear, yeah. I hear your pain, Rob. I hear I. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any anyone else have a question for Chris about how this all works and how to integrate the VR into the classroom and some of the lessons he's learned? I have a question while we're waiting. Okay. All right, Dan. He'll go for it. Then. Mike her. Then it's Mike her. I'm messaging about the. I'll come up front a little bit here. Um, Chris and I've been messaging about the Pico Neo two, mm -hmm. and I just wonder. Yeah, yeah, I'm quite excited about it. Um, hopefully, talking to somebody very soon. But uh, what about content? And I think it accesses Steam VR and yeah. Viveport. But both. any Oculus it's a, side it's quest, an open, nothing more. It's an open headset, so it uh -huh. should be able to access. It should be able to access both of those platforms. Definitely Viveport, yeah. and I believe Ste I was doing some reading the other day. Looks like Steam because it is going to be able to connect directly to your PC as well. Right, so SideQuest, because SideQuest is really exciting at the moment. I mean, there's, there's so is. many developers coming up and just posting stuff there to, like, early release, and it's all free and just And it's simple. getting a lot easier to use, too. Yeah. Right? I mean, they're exactly, really, yeah. they've advanced the platform quite a bit. It's plug and play now. Like, so like um, middle of December, it just yep. boosted up and suddenly, like, mm -hmm. hey, you know, there's no barriers here. Um, but any idea whether, whether those APKs would run on a um, Pico Neo 2? Unlikely. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, um, okay. I do know the side I'll quest guys. We could ask them directly. In fact, we exactly. should have the side quest guys out there. Yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> on the list. That's on the list. You yeah. bring the them. Guys we'll in. put them in there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All awesome. right. Yeah. Thank Excellent. You. Okay. So we have a friend of yours that, oh, she just disappeared. Who's the friend? Okay. Who's the friend? There, she, she just disappeared off my list. So if you want to get back on my list, you know who you are. You can hit the raise hand button again. Okay. So we have a friend here for you. Oh. Oh, she disappeared again. <laughs> I just hit it. I it's see one. Caitlin. Yes, I see Caitlin in her blue hair right go. there. Hey. Oh, yeah. um, I did, hi, everybody. Oh, <laughs> my gosh, Chris, you did a great job, you know, running the gamut from the tools to the purposes yeah. and the use. I guess at the end, just with all these people gathered in the room, I wondered if there was anything in the trajectory that you considered a surprise along the way, like something that's happened in education and VR that maybe you didn't expect having seen, you know, from beginning to now, and then just maybe mm. something that you're looking forward to 
in 2020 as this develops. Um, yeah, and thanks too for shout outs to mindfulness because I really do see it as the base level of mm -hmm. kind of everything. It's been a pleasure. Hi, Laura. Thanks, Caitlin. So <laughs> surprise, surprises, <laughs> su surprises for me is um, actually the, the standalone. I, it, it came a little bit quicker. I, let me rephrase that. The robustness of standalone yeah. VR, Six Degree of Freedom, came faster. Mm -hmm than I anticipated. It's really kicking ass right now. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> wow. Uh, you know, I knew it was going to come, Ooh. but as you know, I was dabbling with Six Degree of Freedom back with a tango yep. strap to the back of my head and an Innovator Gear VR, and I just didn't mm -hmm. expect it to be this robust so soon. I'm super impressed by that. So that was a surprise. Absolutely. What is um, a surprise to me, too, is I didn't wind back the clock four years ago I didn't realize that photogrammetry could be as close to the matrix as it is right now. I mean, talk about presence when you get some good photogrammetry to try out. It's like, you're there. You are 100% there. The presence level is incredibly high. And what I'm really looking forward to is when we have co-spaces, right? So I'm sitting yeah. in my actual living room and my environment's gonna get red, right? It's gonna, the system's gonna know what's in my environment and you could put on a device, you could put on an a AR device and step into my space with me. Like my actual yeah. physical space, you can watch my grandchild blow out his candles. <laughs> like in oh the gosh. space, you know, well, this I believe is that coming. That's yeah. part of what Microsoft's new SharePoint is doing is mm -hmm. some of that. They're experimenting with that with the HoloLens. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that moment too. Love when we it. talk about that memory capture, that would be like sharing your world and what matters with me. Yeah. So I get to see more about your, you know, your desires and interests. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> the question we're going to have, Caitlin, when we're setting up an event like that, that where we want to meet up is, are we doing that at my house or your house? <laughs> <laughs> where are we putting that slider? Maybe we can put the slider in the middle and it'll like be overlapped we, on each other. Oh, yeah. we do a hybrid. <laughs> Clearly. Clearly we hybridize. I mean, this is amazing. Oh, I love it. It's going to be fascinating. Yeah. Okay, All thank right. you. Thank you, Caitlin. Oh now, um, sort of another friend who's waiting to say hey. Jay? Jay. Oh, did we lose Jay? Uh-oh. Oh, no, we have Jay, Jay from, from Immersive. Oh, Lot, no, live, lost him. Oh. Live virtual reality tours too. Live yeah. 360 tours where you can communicate with the person in the real world giving the tour. That's going to be cool. Oh, uh, oh I can't wait Steven for that. Steven Sato, I know, has got a close eye on that action. Yeah. Don, you're up. Hi. Um, I'm kind of new to this whole thing. This is actually like the first event that I've gone to. So hi, nice to meet you. Oh, oh, good one. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm about to. So, I'm in the preliminary stages, it's the ideation phase really still of like implementing this into my school. I'm at a really big state university, but we don't really have a lot of VR presence in the departments that I'm um, a part of. So I'm just wondering like to secure funding, I'm probably going to need to write grants or whatever. I'm wondering if there's any tips on how to do that. Like how do we secure funding um, for VR programs like this? Like do you have any tips or, or uh well, I know, of some uni I know of some universities that have received funding from grant writing, so it's identifying, you know, a lot of it is searching what grants are available out there and which ones you just want to take. Um, mm. I will need to ask where they're going to find those grants, but I know a number of universities that are getting funding for doing stuff like that. So, so you know, what do you guys want? What is your university specialize? What, what do you guys want to specialize in when it comes to virtual reality? Well, so I, I imagine kind of like, so I, I'm in the physics and geosciences, um, oh, yes. and we have a lot of pretty archaic stuff just because we still have it and it still works, but obviously it can be improved, and I'm looking at this as, as a way to do that and kind of innovate and future-proof ourselves a little bit. Um, so I think it's something that they would want, that they would be receptive to. I just yeah. don't know how to approach them about it. You know, I want to do it well, in the right way, rather. I, I Don, here's some advice to you. Yeah, um, and Daniel, I'm hoping you can remember the acronym, but um, there is a students, a college students in VR group that meets here in Altspace once a month or so. 
and um, so please check them out. It is a um, they're spreading out from the United States, but they do. Um, mm. They're based in U.S. colleges and universities, so it's College Students for VR. But there's an acronym for it, and I'm looking all over the place, and I can't remember. Daniel, do you remember. remember what Michael Michael Zhang has been uh, running mm. it? And uh, anyway, we'll try to find it, and I'll post it again on our Discord channel. Oh, great! I do okay. have and, a bit of um, kind of guerrilla advice, if I may. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you're in your institution, if you know kind of the people in management, if you can identify somebody with a bit of an open mind, there is actually a way that I think you can approach them without going straight to a grant. So mm -hmm. in VR, actually, the first thing they're going to ask you is how much does it cost and so on and so forth. Actually, mm -hmm. I'm about to present to my management the fact that I can save them money with virtual meetings. I can save them carbon dioxide. Uh, you can you can mm. develop new income streams. So if you're a bit entrepreneurial in mind mm. and you can put a bit of a business pitch to get somebody who's open minded, they might take it on and they might just find some internal money. Because if I mean, colleges nowadays are competing for students like crazy. And if you come up with a solution before they even know they have a problem, you're talking about future proofing. If you can put a bit of a like pitch like an elevator pitch business case together and get it in front of the right person, you might find a really great ally and suddenly like they will go and find the money for you if it makes sense to them i'm just saying yeah that makes sense thank you i'll definitely think about okay. that and don when it comes time to it for you to demo to the decision makers because a demo is going to be very important that's going to be key yeah. please reach out to us and we can help you with that all right thank you very jay, much you, jay found out who they were yeah, it's called ICXR. It's the uh, largest community of XR university students. There's 20 universities across North America. Mm -hmm. So Michael Zhang is the president of that organization. Excellent. All Thank right, you so thanks, much. Thanks, Don. Thank you. All right, next up is Rob. And again, thank you for those that are hanging in afterwards, after the thing. We appreciate uh, after the deadline. Love it. I could have a thousand questions. So Rob, how about you? You're again. <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much, and I, and I don't want to hog the floor, but um, uh, Daniel's comments is a, are a good segue to my next question, and it relates to um, your talk, Chris, about creativity. Um, uh, I'm in a new role at my college uh, to help uh, faculty and programs integrate VR and AR into, uh, into their courses, and um, I was speaking recently with um, the coordinator of our fine arts program about um, having their students use tilt brush and other creativity um, programs. Um, and he's pretty excited about it. And I'm just wondering what, um, what you know about uh, possible um, income streams for graduates of a pro program like that who develop that skill, that ability to sculpt and paint in, in VR. Is it, is it, an, is it a, I'm, I'm sort of guessing and uh, sort of speculating with this coordinator that it might be a new income stream for those uh, graduates. So would that be the case in your estimation? So. Some of the feedback I'm getting from my artist friends who are actually, you know, putting uh, assets on the marketplaces and stuff is it is you're not you're not going to make a million bucks off it right now. That's for sure. It's it's really slow because there's so much content out there and the ecosystem hasn't caught up to that yet. Where your money is going to be made is aligning yourself with an institution that's ready to dive into VR and is going to need assets created for them, uh, whether it's a corporation or whatever that would probably be the, the most lucrative path off the bat. Or finding something, uh, and I keep hearing this over and over, um, a lot of this, you know, we've got some big players in the VR scene now, right? And a lot of indies are feeling kind of threatened by that. But where I think some successes are really going to be had is nit niche markets, right? Focusing yeah. on something really niche that a lot of people are going to dive into because it is niche and and make that sparkle like a diamond, and you could have some success there too. Um, can, can avatars are going to be a very important space to be making progress in. Avatar clothing, um, just assets in general. You know, maybe someone just needs space assets, or somebody needs uh, something related to geography, or you know, yeah. really specializing in hitting that hard and becoming kind of the master of that. Could be can I just add to that as well? I think. Mm -hmm. um, alongside like assets, any skills, any 3D spatial skills you can develop now, down, I mean, spatial skills are probably 
in the highest growth demand right now, I think, or maybe not exactly right now, but anybody with a bit of unity, a bit of skills to add value at some point, that's going to support your career, I think, down the line. So even if you're not immediately creating an income right now, uh, it'll, you'll add it to your CV and you can do X, Y, Z and um, spatial, spatial skills. It'll be interesting. You'll stand you, out. You, you uh, asked me earlier what else has surprised me. Going along with that, it has surprised me that creation tools have become so easy that you don't, you know, yeah. before our, digital artists had to have a strong technical bent to them as well. And now somebody like me who comes from a background of, of mental health field, I'm freaking creating stuff. What? I didn't realize I was going to be doing that. <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. You democratized it all. It's crazy. It is. It's, it's, hey, how's it going? So basically, uh, I've yeah. set up a, a not-for-profit using virtual reality and augmented reality and couple therapies and sensory setups and everything uh, to help well-being. Um, basically, I'm using the Oculus Quest at the moment, which we, we, we ended up fundraising for. What I'm asking is, uh, you were saying that uh, the tether cable, I'm assuming, is, is it still in its beta stage or has it actually come out? And exactly. how easy is with the, the Oculus Quest to, um, to create stuff like uh, 3D uh, cameras and uh, our own content, I'm assuming it's got to be attached to a PC first with the anchor cable before uh, I can actually do anything off the, the setup alone. Well, so your first question, yes, uh, the cable is uh, working now with the PC. You can plug it in now. It is up and going. Uh, however, um, you can still do quite a bit on the Quest. Like if you're making 360 content, 3D content, you, you don't necessarily need the computer to do that. Now, obviously to use some of the big creative tools like tilt brush and stuff to its maximum capacity you could definitely tether up and do that on the pc but you can do maybe more than you think on the quest yeah because what we're doing we're, we're going to be going into uh schools we're raising money now for a couple of more headsets to go into in may so and uh go into their well-being day to because it's it's almost pretty much not even heard of around here mm. Um, they did say they had one, a couple of headsets in one school, which I found out it was actually a teacher's headset that he brought in once. Uh, so yeah. we're trying to get in there and uh, we will be starting from a young age, we'll be starting from um, infants and juniors and helping gotcha. people with learning disabilities and people with like uh, social anxieties go through scenario setup, uh, going to the next schools. So instead of them yeah. going there and yeah. getting overwhelmed, they go through a 360 video um, of the journey and yeah. then they get used to it and go over what, how to react to the scenarios without being overwhelmed too much time. Both, both so the Go and the Quest are ideal for watching 360 videos for sure. Yeah. So you can create that on whatever camera you use. You, it's all about managing format files, right? I mean, even you could even use like Sculpt VR or something on the Quest get uh, the side quest app that makes it very easy to manage files yeah, that's side quest I to ask and forth. Yeah. Side que yeah. the side quest um because i couldn't see anything on the screen uh, behind you so i don't know if you put it up or not um the side quest is that a external um, program or is that i can it, get actually on the quest it's a program that will exist on your laptop macintosh whatever you, you put it on and then you plug the quest into it with a USB cable and it'll sync up and then you can manage it from there. No, that's why it's easy to transfer cable. files and, and get your formats it out, adds pull your huge formats out of of value to a quest. Yeah. It adds it huge amount of value to a quest. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Can I just add yeah. I don't know, Chris, if you covered um, 360 cameras at all, but I I use a little um, mm -hmm. Insta 360 Evo. There's also the Views XR. Mm -hmm. um, we did. I think yeah. they're like four or five hundred dollars. Highly recommend it. Very, very easy to make media, move it to your headset and play it. It's you can even with the Views XR, you can even live stream to YouTube and then you uh, tune into the YouTube channel with your headset and now you're watching something somewhere else live in 3D. Um, you can do like teacher training, you can do, you know, I don't know, uh, job tasters very very easy to create and transmit um content to the quest I oh, yeah. yeah
All right. Jay, did you want to say something? Take one more um, question. Okay. Uh, you say, Jay wanted to ask if Engage will allow users to upload their, three, their own 3D models. Very soon. <laughs> Good answer. M, you're on. Professionals that are both IT pros and entrepreneurs. Have you, you seen anything along the line? Elements? Yes. Educators, higher education. Mm -hmm. uh, counseling, absolutely. Uh, like, are you talking like therapy type counseling or? Well, it could be anything oh, from. Seeing. Yeah, it could be anything from uh, advising, career mm -hmm. advising to. Um, um, uh, providing guidance to entrepreneurs, also life coaching, ah. more broadly. Yeah, if, if, I can, if I can interject yes, for a second, we have an amazing brand new team here. They've just presented once. They're going to be presenting regularly coming up um, for V. It's called V Coaching and, and uh, per Personal Development. So it's for personal and professional development and coaching and everything you just described. Um, so we have a channel on our Discord about all of that, and they're going to be um, – like I said, they've only done they've won one presentation last month, and they're going to be doing those regularly coming up. Uh, Dana Maria um, is uh, heading that up, and uh, who's Captain VR? She's awesome. So expect more yeah. of those. Now, I'd like to hear Chris. What have you found in that area? Yeah. Well, first of all, the field is so freaking ripe for exactly that. I mean, I think that's going to be a big business in VR. Um, I'm more accustomed to what's going on in the mental health side of things. I'm seeing a lot of activity in the mental health side of things where it's one-on-one -on -one and even group therapies and whatnot. Look up Very Real Help Noah Robinson. Uh, he's doing substance abuse counseling. He's an amazing what he's doing. There's a lot of stuff going on at Stanford as well. Uh, but yeah, um, remote therapy and counseling is really picking up steam. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I know there's a million other questions. Uh, Chris, if you, if you have some time to hang around after, um, you can you know, answer some of those. But I want to thank everyone so much for being here. Let's give another giant round of love and applause for the amazing Chris Madsen. Suck it in, my friend. This is well-deserved. Oh, well-deserved. Well thank you. Thank you, yeah. Chris. Yeah. And thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for helping to yes. make educators in VR just such a success that it is.